for as long as people have called this place home. They've been welcomed with clean air, clean water, and an abundance of nature. As time went on, people saw the need to balance how we build cities with how we protect farms and forests. That's why across Greater Portland, in 24 cities and three counties, there's one metro government that brings us all together to maintain that vital balance, to provide services across cities and counties, to create a better future together. Hello, we're Metro. We plan for housing, jobs, and safe transportation. We protect land, air, and water by managing garbage and recycling. We support arts and culture by overseeing local venues to keep the economy growing. And we connect people to nature across 17,000 acres of parks and trails and at the Oregon Zoo. Metro is all of us working together, connecting how we live today with how we plan for the future. Hello, we're Metro. And so are you. Right. We have a quorum, and I'm calling the Metro Council business meeting for December 8th, 2022, to order. And I will now ask our clerk, Connor, to call the roll for attendance. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rosenthal. Present. Councilor Wong. Oh, present. Councilor Lewis. Present. Councilor Craddock. Present. Councilor Nolan. Good morning. Present. Good morning. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez. Uh, present. And President Peterson. Present. Thank you. Uh, before we begin our agenda items, can we please play the safety video for in-person attendees? Hi, I'm Justin Dunlap, and I'm the department head stagehand electrician at the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall. Safety is a big part of my job. From electrical, making sure that I stay up to date on the NFPA codes and regulations, to rigging, where we make sure that everything is safely suspended overhead, to egress, ensuring that our audiences, performers, and technicians have the safest possible route in case of emergency. I'm out here at the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall, and you're in the Metro Regional Center. Please note that we're on the third floor of the building. In the event of a fire or fire alarm, please exit through the door in the northeast corner of the room. Go down the steps to the second floor and exit through the main entrance by the reception desk. We will meet in the courtyard outside that entrance. In the event of a medical or fire emergency, please call 911 and notify the security agent at the front desk. The nearest defibrillator is mounted on the steps leading from the reception desk down to Grand Avenue. Great, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to our public uh, communication portion of our agenda. Connor, will you please describe to the audience our procedures for the public communication portion of the meeting on non-agenda items? Yes, thank you, President Peterson. Uh, so if anyone wishes to testify on non-agenda items, now is the time to do so. Public testimony will be limited to three minutes, and I'll manage a timer to go off at the three-minute mark. If you've not already signed up to speak, you can do so now. Uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, you can sign up by hitting the virtual raise hand button. If you're joining us in person, you can sign up to speak by filling out one of the blue cards in the back of the room. Uh, and so for those joining us virtually, in order to allow those testifying to turn on their cameras, I'll be promoting you to a full panelist. So when I call your name, you'll see a window pop up asking you to accept the promotion. Once you accept that, you'll rejoin as a panelist where you'll be able to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. And as a reminder to everybody testifying today, you do not need to uh, give your physical address. However, please do identify yourself for the record before testifying. All right. Uh, President Peterson and counselors, we have not had anybody sign up in advance to speak today. And I'll just give folks another minute. Oh, Oops. we have somebody. Oh, oh. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Come on. Come on up. And you can sit at uh, either of these tables here. Good morning. Good morning. Les Poole, I live in Clackamas County. I see some familiar faces from years ago and <laughs> Damascus and light rail and all the issues I've been involved in through the years. Um, I'm what you'd call a citizen activist. Activist sometimes is a pretty broad term for it, but um, 
I bring a message of accountability to the county and, and to government in Oregon. Um, and I try to bring a message from folks that often can't attend these meetings. They can't participate or sometimes they're intimidated. It can be intimidating and, and they, they're a little afraid to come. Uh, this evening in Clackamas County, we'll have our monthly evening board meeting. And that was a concept that I drove to the agenda years ago. And the idea was to provide more availability and access, critical access to the public and, and frankly, to the young folks. Um, I've noted that the two o'clock Metro meeting is now at 1030 in the morning, which makes it maybe more convenient for some, but uh, it, it further inhibits the ability for the public to participate. So I would encourage that we look at the uh, possibility of some evening meetings and um, I, I really think that the two o'clock in the afternoon time should be reinstated. Um, there's been a message that's ringing loud and clear, especially in Clackamas County, but I think across the region. And that message is that folks are feeling really tapped out. Inflation, uh, government largesse, if I can say that without offending anyone, um, and excessive debt are really, really hurting folks. And it's contributing to the homeless problem and a multitude of other things that we don't have time to discuss in three minutes. But um, if one looks at the results of the recent election, you'll see that those that are more careful with money were running um, for accountability. And accountability is a word that seems lost in today's government. It really is uh, pretty clear in Salem over the last few years that what are we getting for our investment in time, money, and effort? And um, there's a lot of excess, I'll use that word again, excess, that is costing us all. Um, I, I brought something I want to leave with you for future consideration. Um, it's a mirrored on what we have in Clackamas County, and that is a nonpartisan resolution. I think one thing that would help is for the public and for you folks to all, and myself included, be mindful that Metro is a nonpartisan body. And uh, the resolution here is very straightforward. It's based on the one that we operate under in Clackamas County. So I'll leave this and follow up with you in the future and look forward to uh, sharing a message in the future that uh, resonates with you folks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll donate my last 15 seconds to the Great. next speaker. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if anyone else wishes to speak, uh, either in the audience or virtually, um, now is the time to do so. And I still do not see, I don't see any hands going up virtually, President Peterson and I don't see anybody else in the room who wishes to testify. Great, thank you. I will close the uh, public communication portion of the meeting on non-agenda items, and we will move on to our consent agenda. Today's consent agenda now consists of two items. Resolution number 22-5291 for the purpose of adding three new and amending three existing projects in the 2021 through 26 Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program to meet required Federal Highways Administration obligation or delivery approval steps and resolution number 22-5294 for the purpose of authorizing the chief operating officer to issue a new non-system license to core disposal LLC for transport of commercial food waste to the Annan Brothers Inc. compost facility located in Marion County, Oregon. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? I'll move for approval. Thank you. Seconded. Second. <laughs> Been moved by uh, Councillor Craddock and seconded by Councillor Gonzalez, but I did hear you, Councillor Lewis, a second later. Thank you. Um, all, is there any discussion? All those? Uh, oh, yes. I just want to make a comment. It's nice to see some additions from the federal program uh, for uh, charging stations for electric vehicles on both 205 and I-5. That was welcome. Oh, thank you. With that, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the motion passes, thank you. 
We'll move on to our resolution, resolution number 22-5300 for the purpose of Metro Council's acceptance of the results of the independent audit for financial activity during fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. Today we have uh, both our uh, Metro Auditor, Brian Evans, independently elected, uh, and our Chief Financial Officer, Brian Kennedy. If you both want to step forward, I know we've got some other folks that you may want to bring up and introduce. Good morning. There should be someone, Leela, Anna, yeah. that you need yeah. to pull through as a panelist, please. Thanks, good morning. Good morning. Council President Peterson and Metro Councilors, I'm joined today by Ashley Austin um, and Leela Annan, who is virtually joining us on the Zoom meeting um, from Los Adams to present the results of the financial audit for the fiscal year uh, that ended at June 30th, 2022. Um, we're also joined by Brian Kennedy, Metro's Chief Financial Officer, who will give the management response to the audit. As a reminder, Oregon law requires Metro to file a financial audit with the state of Oregon by the end of the calendar year. And this presentation and the accompanying resolution are the last steps in this financial audit process. The purpose is to inform the council and the public about the results of the audit and to adopt a corrective action plan if needed to address any identified deficiencies. Prior to today's presentation, Metro's audit committee met twice. The first meeting was held in June, or sorry, it was May this year, um, to discuss Moss Adams' plan for the audit. And the second meeting happened at the end of November to hear the audit results. I want to thank the members of the audit committee, including Councillor Rosenthal, Merck Commissioner Damian Hall, as well as the four community members that are part of the committee. I'd also like to spend a special thanks to two of the community members who are ending their service this year. That's Ann Darrow and Andrew Carlson. They've served the maximum eight years that they possibly can, and so really appreciate their dedication uh, to the audit committee process. And just so you all know, I'll be spurting a process in January to recruit folks to fill those vacant community member positions. Um, I'd also like to thank Ashley Austin, Brian Kennedy, and their teams for their work on the audit. It always runs smoothly and appreciate their diligence to get the audit work done on time. I'll pass it over to Ashley to talk about the audit results. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for having me today. I'm going to just go through a quick presentation that outlines the results of our audit. It, this is more high level than the audit committee meeting that we went through, the more detail um, of the results of the audit. Next slide, please. So just a quick agenda. I'll go through the auditor opinions and reports, uh, a brief highlight of the required communications with those charged with governance, and then just some quick other information as well. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, this first slide outlines uh, the audit opinion on your financial statements. And we issued a clean opinion, which means that your financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with US generally accepted accounting principles. That's what you wanna hear. That's uh, the highest level of assurance <laughs> that you can receive. It takes me 30 seconds to say it, but it took a long time to get here. So a lot of work and a lot of diligence throughout the year. So uh, kudos to management. Next slide, please. We also issue two additional reports as a result of the fact that Metro receives and spends federal dollars. So the first report is on financial reporting in accordance with government auditing standards. And that report showed no control findings, no compliance findings, a clean opinion there. And then the second opinion is re really driven at um, the two buckets of funding that we audited, which were the Shuttered Venues Operating Grant, the SVOG dollars, 20 million that Metro received this year, and then the Federal Transit Cluster, I think, um, a federal dollars that received and spent. And as a result of our procedures, you know, we have to look at direct and material compliance requirements, very, um, very small details. We have to really review if anything's over 50 cents. Um, there's a lot m less materiality for those procedures than in the financial statement audit. So to come out of that audit clean, no control findings, no compliance findings, that means that you are spending and uh, spending those dollars appropriately and in accordance with those standards. So our opinion on that particular, those two sets of funding are also clean. Next slide, please. 
So we also issue two additional reports. Uh, the first report on the top of the slide here is related to the Oregon, Oregon Municipal Auditing Standards. So because you're an Oregon Municipal Corporation, you are required to comply with various standards, including um, adopting and approving your budget on a timely basis. Um, and there's pro, uh, procurement standards that you have to comply with, along with various other items as well. We look at those items in detail. Uh, no control findings that we uh, identified as a result of our procedures. However, we did identify um, one item where there was an overexpenditure of funds. And uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, real way to not report that. If there's an overexpenditure, we are required to report it in our opinion. So we did report uh, the one overexpenditure of funds. And it was in the general fund in the parks and nature for about $277,000. And that's also disclosed in Metro's financial statement notes as well. The final opinion on this slide is really related to those bond expenditures, uh, related to the natural areas, general obligation bonds, the uh, affordable housing, and then also the parks and nature. And what Metro Council has done is included in the ballot measure uh, basically an indication to the public that you will have those dollars looked at to make sure that those expenditures are reasonable and appropriate and in accordance with the bond measure. And based on our procedures, we did not identify any expenditures that were not um, spent for that particular purpose. So those were all clean as well. Next slide, please. So now just a quick overview of our required communications with those charged with governance. Next slide. So we did have, as Brian mentioned, an in-depth discussion, uh, including all of, our, all of our required communications with the Audit Committee in late November. Of course, we are uh, pushing to hit the reporting deadline, which uh, Brian also mentioned is December 31st. A few things that you as the council would want to know, uh, no corrected or uncorrected audit adjustments were identified as a result of our audit procedures. So that means that the trial balance that we received uh, we didn't have any adjustments to it to the numbers that you uh, see in the final financial statements. Uh, no uncorrected audit adjustments either. Uh, then there were no difficulties encountered in performing the audit. That would be if we had issues getting access to information, getting access to individuals throughout uh, Metro, no, no issues related to that. And then there were no disagreements with management. And that really gets to if you had a disagreement with uh, in terms of an accounting transaction or an auditing procedure that you were performing. No, none of those disagreements happened either. So next slide, please. Gosh, that is so small up there. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that small for other people, but I'm going to look at my notes here. So uh, this really gets at the deficiencies in internal control. So I'm uh, pleased to report that there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in noncompliance reported. Uh, but we did have a few current year best practice recommendations and some updates on the prior year recommendations as well. I am joined by Leela Annan, the senior manager for the IT team, and she's going to go through some of the IT items on this slide. I'm going to go through the financial statement items first. So the first one under the current year best practice recommendations relates to the OPEB census, so your other post-employment benefit obligation census. So what we do related to that census is the census is provided to the actuary to then provide you with a liability to record. We test that census data that's sent to the actuary to determine whether or not we can rely on the information that's coming from the actuary, right? Make sure that that information is correct. And as a result of our testing of that census data, we noted that there was some mismatch of information. So the, the information didn't necessarily match up with the um, information that we tested. The, the, immaterial, the differences were immaterial, however, um, and I know that that happens because a lot of different data is merged together in order to send it to the actuary. So just a recommendation there to have that information reviewed before it's sent to the actuary in order to have the liability be generated and the analysis by the actuary be performed. Update on prior year recommendations. Uh, so the first one on there is accounts receivable. In 2021, we identified a receivable that was recorded, but it had been collected um, before year end, so it shouldn't have been recorded as a receivable. None of those this year. Payroll time card approval. We did, um, last year we did identify as a result of management providing some information to us that some time cards had not been reviewed in the planning department. We didn't identify any time cards that hadn't been approved in the planning department in the current year. 
We did have some isolated incidents, uh, one isolated incident of a time card not being approved, but that was as a result of the Kronos malware attack that happened in December. We performed a significant amount more procedures around that particular payroll period because the controls changed. So we did our regular payroll control testing, didn't identify any uh, time cards that hadn't been approved. Everything was fine. But one of the, um, but that one pay period did have one um, time card that hadn't been approved. But we consider that isolated in nature just due to the nature of the, the malware attack that had happened during that payroll period. And then finally, the expenditure approval. That's really related to the single audit and the federal audit that we perform. And we just identified in 2021 there, was, there wasn't uh, formal documentation maintained of review. And this year, during those audit procedures, we identified that there was appropriate documentation of review maintained. I'm going to hand it over to Leela to now go through the IT items on this slide. Thank you, Ashley. Can you confirm you can hear me? I can hear you. Perfect, thank you. So uh, we'll jump back up to the, the middle section here where we talk about current year best practice recommendations. So the first one here is change management. Um, from a scope perspective, we look at all systems that are relevant to financial reporting. It includes PeopleSoft, the uh, event management system, as well as uh, Waymaster supporting the scale houses. And this year, our uh, well, let me back up. Change management here is referring to uh, changes to these systems and the, the processes used and followed to manage those changes through, through the process, making sure that they're properly tested and properly authorized and that there's an appropriate segregation of duties in place um, for those changes. So this year, our, our best practice recommendation it did not result in any um, adjustments needed to our audit procedures, was simply just to um, kind of enhance the documentation around those changes. Management was able to explain all of the changes and, and uh, provide uh, sufficient information for us to conclude that there were no deficiencies, um, but the the effort to go through some of um, those conversations uh, led us to that best practice recommendation. So that's a pretty simple one. Management is already in the process of, of uh, further retaining documentation there. From an update on prior year recommendations, we did have a number of them. Um, so the uh, user access reviews, um, this one is, is one where we continue to recommend management to um, retain or improve their document retention processes around, around these access reviews. Uh, it's really around making sure that all of the approvals are documented with dates, that all of the users are included and any remedial actions that are taken are documented and closed out. Um, again, nothing here that altered um, how we approached our audit, more so just recommending to management to retain the documentation. Uh, from an administrative per permissions perspective, this was also a repeat from prior year. Here, what we do is we look at who has um, those elevated permissions with, within the, the systems, and uh, we look at uh, who those individuals are and are they appropriate granted that access and then appropriately monitored as well. And the monitoring aspect is what um, management is has not yet implemented. So they have the capabilities, um, the information is out there and management is in the process of um, establishing that review for the for the fiscal 23 period. Um, there was one uh, observation that was resolved this year that was related to password configurations and just aligning the system configurations with their policies. So uh, that pretty much sums it up. Um, anything else to add, Ashley? No, nope, that's great. We can go to the next slide, please. And to the final slide. So just a quick update on some new standards that are being adopted by Metro in the future. So GASB 94 and 96 both are required to be adopted by Metro in 2023. 91 is related to those agreements that you have uh, to operate specific spaces potentially with a public party or maybe with um, another private party. Uh, so this will take a lot of uh, just general uh, 
aggregate of information and putting it together and making sure that you're analyzing all the appropriate agreements. So that will take some time. And then GASB 96, uh, I didn't mention it, but Metro did adopt GASB 87 this year, which required all leases, uh, capital and operating in nature, operating in nature to come onto the balance sheet um, as a right to use asset and corresponding liability or a lease receivable and a deferred inflow of resources. 96, uh, really brings all of your subscription-based IT uh, items onto the balance sheet now. So it's really similar to GASB 87, which looked at hardware, but also buildings, equipment, you know, things that you can tangibly touch. This is really related to those IT items that uh, will now need to be reviewed and determined whether or not they are also applicable and need to be recorded. GASB 99 and 101, they have some dates a little bit further out on the runway, so that's kind of nice. GASB still doesn't sleep and uh, continues to pump out those standards that uh, require some additional uh, analysis. So just a plug for the accounting team here to be able to continue to have that training that they need to in order to adopt these standards appropriately. The next slide is just our contact information in the case that you might have some questions that you didn't get answered today. You can always feel free to reach out to us and then open it up for questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Counselors, any questions at this point? Otherwise, we'll move on to our chief financial officer. Brian Kennedy. Thank you, Council President Peterson, members of the Metro Council. My name is Brian Kennedy. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Metro. Thank you for the chance to be here today. Uh, this presenting of the annual comprehensive financial report is a really important part of our ongoing commitment to financial transparency and accountability. It's something we take very, very seriously, and um, we really appreciate the chance to talk with you about it a little bit. Um, first, I want to thank Auditor Evans and the Moss Adams team, um, Ashley Austin and her whole team, um, for working with us on this process. Um, we enjoy, enjoy the opportunity to go through this um, and appreciate their diligence and professionalism um, always in how they approach the audit work. Um, we wouldn't be here without our team in finance. Um, our financial reporting team is led by Caleb Ford, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, Melissa Weber, our controller, and then Erica Gallucci, our accounting program manager. Um, they do an incredible amount of work producing our financial statements and making sure that the audit process um, <clears throat> goes well and that the auditor doesn't encounter any difficulties. Um, but it's also really important to recognize that while the audit is a point in time, um, you know, it's a fairly focused engagement, um, this work is constantly ongoing. And in order to have the, that clean audit process and um, to be able to produce those financial statements, there's work that happens every single day. And so we are um, very grateful to our general ledger team, our accounts receivable team, our accounts payable team. Um, they're the people who make sure that we have, that our internal control processes are followed and that we are prepared to work with the auditors when that time comes. So again, a huge thanks to them. And then finally, a thank you to the Metro Council because without your leadership um, and support for strong financial policies and uh, building the, the structures we need to have the financial system to produce this work, um, we wouldn't be here either. So jumping to the financial results. <clears throat> First, um, if you go through the financial statements, um, it's a big intimidating document, but I would encourage you um, to read management's discussion and analysis and the notes to the financial statements. That'll get you the, the highlights. Um, a couple things you'll encounter is, um, first, this is the first full year that the activity of the supporting supportive housing services is fully reflected. There was a little bit of activity in the prior fiscal year, um, but this year you really see the impact on Metro's activities. Also, um, compared to last year, we have um, improvements in the net position for both our governmental activities and our business type activities. You can see that while we are not fully recovered from the pandemic in all areas, our strong recovery continues and um, our strong financial policies that have built up those healthy reserves and put us in a position to recover are still in place. Um, moving to the audit results, we're really pleased that there are no significant findings. Um, <clears throat> again, that's a testament to the work of our team um, staying on top of those internal controls. 
Um, I do want to recognize we did have a budget violation. Um, this is part of the general fund. It's related to the Glendivere Golf Course. Um, frankly, we're embarrassed um, by this. It's a, a small piece of our activity. Um, Glendivere is operated by a concessionaire, and when golf does well, um, revenues go up, but also expenditures. And um, we missed capturing some of that increased activity, and we're working on changing our processes so that we don't miss that in the future. We also um, appreciate Moss Adams and the management letter comments they provided, um, particularly related to the OPEB census. Um, this is symptomatic of some of the larger system challenges we have with a lot of manual processes, and we have um, several significant projects ongoing right now to try to improve that reporting so that we're not in this position again, but it is something that we um, very carefully pay attention to. So again, thank you for the chance to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, and congratulations on um, this outcome. It, it does take a lot of work, so thank you. Councilors, any questions? Councilor Craddock and then Councilor Lewis. Thank you very much for this uh, annual experience. I, you guys always do such good work, and Otter Evans, thank you for being the organizing um, person of all of this and leading this. It's always um, helpful as um, someone's in an elected position to be able to state to the public that we have multiple um, opportunities where our finances are being monitored. Of course, with our independent auditor, with our hired auditing um, you know, business, the Moss Adams, and then of course, all the internal work that Metro does. And then our oversight committees. We depend a lot on our oversight committees that are uh, focusing on the initiatives that we've asked the voters for support on. So always really been proud, as I said, I've been on the Metro Council on the uh, really sound financial management that this agency has and appreciate Moss Adams being that partner in this to be able to state fully that you, you agree with us with my observation and with the staff's um, presentations that way that Metro's doing a good job. So thank you very much. Um, I do have a question though uh, regarding the parks and nature over expenditure. Is that what the Glendivere, is that where that, what, that occurred? Okay. So I'm going to make sure if that was a spe the specific overture that uh, Moss Adams was referring to. Yes, Councilor Craddock. We track the Glendivere Golf uh, revenues and expenditures in a, a sub fund, the general fund, which has its own appropriations category. And it's a primarily um, kind of a, an in, in and out increased re when, when golf is doing well, revenues come in and many of those um, dollars move back out the door, compensating our concessionaire, paying for expenses of the golf course. And uh, we just had higher than expected revenues last fiscal year and didn't make the necessary budget adjustment to avoid that overage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Lewis. Yes, thank you. Thank you to the whole team, uh, Brian, but also uh, everybody at Moss Adams. Uh, really appreciate uh, that you were able to get access to everything you needed and did not uh, run into any obstacles, particularly as we're continuing to exist um, in this uh, kind of new hybrid world. Um, I did have a question uh, regarding uh, kind of where we are uh, with our computer systems. You noticed about half of the remnants uh, were IT uh, checkups, and then we had the malware attack. And um, Brian, you mentioned how much of our system uh, is legacy that we're having to do manual work on, and manual opens us up to multiple vulnerabilities as well as errors. Um, so I guess my question is, do we need additional staff to help with this transition procurement? Um, do we need it to be embedded in the departments that use those uh, systems? Does it need to be in finance? Does it need to be in ISIT? Um, and I guess I'm asking a solution systems question, but hopefully uh, something that management has considered as this is the, our, potentially our biggest vulnerability right now. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lewis. Um, a couple of notes. Um, in the last fiscal year, we did add additional staffing resources to the IT department, um, in part to help um, uh, address these challenges. I know they continue to have some challenges uh, recruiting staff, so we have, you know, they have positions they're working on filling, and we think once we get those filled, um, we will have more resources. We also um, 
closely monitor um, kind of the, the resource needs. And um, so if there is identified need for additional either staff or contracted resources to help with um, some of this work, we'll make sure that um, that is approved. And if council needs to take action in the budget, we'll bring that forward for your consideration. And then finally, in the last year's budget, um, we approved both um, consulting services funds and a, a position to lead an overall um, a roadmap project for our key enterprise systems. Um, that work is just getting started and we think that going through that process will give us um, a good guide to how to make sure to kind of ensure that our systems are resilient and as automated as possible for um, the, the future. And I don't have a, a significant update on that. Um, that project is being run by um, Deputy Chief Op Operating Officer Andrew Scott. And so I know they're getting ready to recruit for that project manager position to lead that roadmap work. Excellent, thank you so much. And I remember that roadmap and uh, hopefully we can uh, move it along. I appreciate that it takes time to find folks uh, who can come in and fill the open positions as well. So thank you for reminding me that those are posted. Appreciate it. Great, thank you. Councilor Gonzalez. Uh, thanks, President Peterson. Uh, just some short comments. Thank you for the very diligent work. Um, and uh, Brian also for the uh, explanation and the clarity as well. Um, similar to Councilor Lewis, just wanted to acknowledge that um, you know, uh, this work has happened in, in hybrid environment and in transitions between uh, expectations of the workplace. Um, and despite those massive changes, you know, the fact that we're able to, you know, really, really focus on compliance and best practices to this, to this level is, um, it inspires confidence and I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I, um, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, I do know that uh, over the last few weeks, we've uh, implemented, not necessarily just through finance, but a suite of IT and login and just administrative uh, improvements uh, for our, for just accessing Metro things. Um, and the pain of that, you know, has is worth worthwhile um, just to make sure that we're, we're top notch and um, just want to acknowledge that um, you know, definitely see the work happening uh, and the improvements. So I want to uh, appreciate that, and um, in general, happy that we have controls in place. That you know, a billion dollar agency, we can find a, a line item where there's a discrepancy, and then move to correct it. It's, uh, it's you know exactly why we do this. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, Seeing no other hands raised, I know that our attorney has a small glitch that she'd like to <laughs> um, raise um, before we make a motion. Um, I have a question, a clarifying question with respect to the report. Um, I don't believe that there is any corrective action plan that was um, identified in that report. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, okay, so Auditor Evans, um, the resolution as submitted um, uh, had council adopting a corrective action plan as was proposed in the report. And so I would recommend just for clarity of record here, um, this is good news, <laughs> um, that um, when council president Peterson asked for a motion, you just ask that we strike that, that motion is made while striking um, that last clause and the last sentence of the resolution referring to a corrective action plan. Okay. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna read a statement and then ask for a motion. Um, as explained in the auditor's report, there are no corrective actions. I also know that the documents labeled attachment three and four of the staff report is the report that consti constitutes attachment A. Therefore, I will look for a motion to adopt resolution number 22-5300 as introduced, but striking the final clause and adopts the corrective action plan as presented therein. Do I have a motion? I have so moved. And I will second that motion with said technical changes. It's been moved by Councillor Rosenthal, seconded by Councillor Gonzalez. Uh, Connor, will you please call? Oh, is there any further discussion? Uh, yes, Councillor Rosenthal. You know, I just want to thank, particularly, want to thank Moss Adams for their clarity in the presentation. I appreciate that. I thank our auditor Evans for his due diligence and hard work. And I particularly want to give kudos to our management team for coming up with something that's very easy to review to sit in the meeting and to say, hey, there's almost nothing here to really look at. I really appreciate that. It's not quite a James Webb tele telescope kind of uh, 
thing, but it's pretty close. <laughs> wow. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, Connor, will you please call the roll? Yes. Thank you, President Peterson. <laughs> Councilor Craddock. Aye. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Councilor Gonzalez. Uh, yes. Councilor Rosenthal. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Wong. Aye. And President Peterson. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. All right. We will move on to resolution number 22-5293 for the purpose of incorporating inclusive and plain language best practices of Metro code and establishing code updates as appropriate. Uh, counselors, I think we can all agree that Metro should seek a Metro code that is easy to read and understand and a code that does not harm, offend, or exclude people it serves. The Office of Metro Attorney shares those goals and has been working to develop the resolution we have in front of us today. We have our senior attorney, Shane Ebma, and we have Amber Espinoza from Public Affairs. Who's kicking off? I am. Jane, go ahead. Good morning, Council President Peterson and members of the Council. For the record, my name is Shane Abma. I'm with the Metro Attorney's Office. I use he and him pronouns, and I primarily advise the Solid Waste Division in the Supportive Housing Services Program. With me is Amber Espinoza. She is a Public Affairs Specialist with the Communications Department. She is also co-author co of Metro's Inclusive Language Style Guide. We are here to present on Resolution 22-5293. This would require Metro to incorporate plain language and inclusive language principles in the Metro Code and require housekeeping code updates. I'm going to start by discussing plain language, what this means and why it's important. Amber will then discuss inclusive language principles and why those are important. And then finally, I will speak a little about the code updates. So first, let's start with plain language. What is it and why should we use it? You've probably all read a statute or a contract that is difficult to understand. It may have used archaic words like heretofore, herewith, the party of the first part, etc. It had long sentences with lots of commas. Perhaps it was peppered with shalls throughout, even though shall is a term we do not use in modern language modern English language anyway. <laughs> this is sometimes called legalese, but it's really just poor writing because it's hard to understand and it's hard to read. Good writing takes time. It takes effort. Using plain language makes things easier to read and understand. It makes our writings more accessible to more people. And this is particularly important with code language that regulates conduct. Before working at Metro, I worked for the city attorney's office in Portland. I advise the city's tax division and its permit division. So think of taxi permits, tow permits, parade permits, street sign permits. I did all the permits. And I often had to explain to taxpayers, to individuals, and even to city staff what some of our city code sections meant because they were so difficult to understand and read. And then one day I had an epiphany. <laughs> Instead of spending time explaining these code sections again and again and again, what if we just wrote them better? <laughs> What if we just made city code easier to understand? That's when I learned about plain language and the movement that was in legal writing at the time. And I became a huge fan of it. And I've been advocating for it ever since. And I try and incorporate those principles in my own work. Plain language emphasizes clarity and brevity. It improves accessibility and readability. It avoids long sentences, archaic terms, passive voice, and legal jargon. If you're interested in some specific examples of this, there are several in attachment A that was uh, submitted with the staff report. In short, something doesn't need to sound legal to be legal. Mm. What it needs to be is understandable and readable. And this is why Metro should incorporate plain language principles in the Metro code. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Amber to speak with you a little bit about the importance of inclusive language principles. And you may not know that Metro has adopted an inclusive language style guide. So she's going to speak a little bit about the process and where we are with that. Amber? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Council President Peterson and members of the Metro Council. I'll briefly begin, I'll begin by briefly sharing the origin story of our inclusive language style guide. Several years ago, Leah Yyoli, who's our interim communications director, she went to a conference where she learned about the city of Oakland's style guide and one of the key features of the city of oakland style guide 
is that it encourages its employees to use inclusive language. So what is inclusive language? Um, practicing inclusive language really begins by recognizing that words are really powerful, that words um, have the power to shape our lives in really important ways, from how we treat one another, to the laws and practices that people put into place, to the services that people can access. Throughout time, people have used words to exclude, alienate, oppress, and discriminate people, um, or they've used words to perpetuate stereotypes and inaccurate information. Mm. And then over time, these prejudiced beliefs become cemented in language. And so inclusive, using inclusive language means that we're writing respectfully about people, uh, about the, the people that we serve in the region and the people we work with in the region. And um, it encourages people to use gender neutral language to be specific and to add context. So not only are we writing in a way that's uh, respectful, but also in a way that's accurate. And um, that is why Leah brought, up, brought this idea to our department to create an inclusive language style guide, because it's one way that we can build trust by being very thoughtful and accurate about the way that we're writing about people, in addition to the way that, how we're writing for people too in, in accessible plain language. And so a few years ago, uh, we brought a Hatfield fellow to help us start the inclusive language style guide. She interviewed several colleagues throughout Metro to inform what entries we were going to include. And then when her fellowship ended, my former colleague Ashley Apodaca and I volunteered to continue to uh, work on this project. We continue to talk to colleagues throughout the organization at Metro and our colleagues shared their personal insights because they either identify with some of the identities that we're writing about in the inclusive language style guide or they have lived experiences. So we really took from our colleagues to inform how we were going to create the, the style guide. And, um, and it's, we published it a little over a year ago. It's a living document because we recognize that it's gonna be important to keep up with the changes in language. And we aspire to um, get community feedback from this eventually. Um, the pandemic kind of put a wrench in our plans, but we did wanna ask people we serve in the region to take a look at our entries and, and tell us did we get it right? What are we missing? What are some assumptions that we need to undo here? Um, so we aspire to do that one day, and we hope that this is something that we'll be able to share with jurisdictional partners one day. And um, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you. And, and that was on the style guide. Yes, the inclusive language style guide. And, and the inclusive language has been incorporated into these changes that we see before us today. So is there a good example? I, I did a quick scan of the Metro code and the big one that I see is gender, gender neutral language. That's a, that's a really big one. So you'll see there at the beginning of the code, there's definitions for how terms are used and one of them is gender. It says one gender includes the other. So that, that would be a key one where we're using gender neutral language so that we don't have to say his or her or, you know, it just it would take into account that there's um, gender spectrum. That's one. And then uh, also it, inclusive language is about being specific and adding context. So when we say community, so that's very vague. So if, if the code has anything about community members, that might be another example. I'd have to do, we would have to do an audit, um, but, but there are things that we could easily apply to the Metro code. That's great, we got a bunch of hands raised. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Councilor Huang, Rosenthal, Lewis. Go ahead, Councilor Huang. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for all the work that's being done on this. I think it makes a ton of sense and will definitely make um, you know, our materials and work much more accessible to the community. Um, just on the style guide, I'm wondering what the process was in developing it, and um, I see that was adopted in October of 2021, and is, is that adopted by like the COO's office as well, and then our individual kind of departments and those that, you know, touch upon it, are they being trained on kind of its, its adoption so that's it's uniform across the, the whole metro government? 
it's it wasn't adopted in the sense that uh, it was like adopted by say for example the office of the uh, um, COO um, adopted in the sense that we that we published an internal resource for uh, our entire organization and people are using it we get we get questions about inclusive language all the time um, so we're fielding questions and we're using we're training our, our colleagues in the, in the communications department. People have already been trained on this and are already ambassadors of the inclusive language style guide. So um, in that sense, it's, it's being used frequently. Um, but, but there's no requirement to use it. Um, it it's, there's no requirement. It's something that we highly encourage people. We, we, uh, we've let people know about this. And when, when we edit, copy edit, for other colleagues in, throughout the organization, we're copy editing with um, inclusive language principles. Great, thank you. Well, I would encourage our CEO's office to uh, review this and, of course, uh, you know, make it as widely used as possible so that you know we're speaking with one voice. Thank you, thank you. We would love that. <laughs> uh, Councillor Rosenthal. Yeah, th thanks. I think this is a great work, and I applaud the efforts to move towards simplicity. Uh, words matter, as you pointed out. My question is, you've mentioned um, we hope for the opportunity to share this with our other jurisdictions. I'm just wondering if, do we have a mechanism for doing that? Have we gotten any feedback at all, or are any of the other jurisdictions working on something similar? I'm not aware of other jurisdictions in the region working on this. There, there are a lot of jurisdictions throughout the country that are adopting inclusive language principles. And it's not just government organizations, it's also universities, hospitals. Um, and I think the way that we would do that is by connecting with our, our other communications coll colleagues. So it's, it's something that we aspire. We haven't, we haven't taken any formal steps to do that yet, um, but we do have ideas about what that would look like. And we would begin by connecting with our communications colleagues at other jurisdictions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lewis. Sure, thank you so much. Um, heretofore, I had not considered the shelf life of language, um, but definitely am now thinking through, you know, outside of our technical terms, there's a lot that can uh, change and shift um, in almost all of our documents without changing the meeting, uh, meaning. Um, and I guess I'm wondering um, what your treatment of technical terms is. Um, obviously, in code, they have to stay, um, but in terms of more casual communication, um, what the style guide recommendation is for how we deal with our technical terms, particularly in um, solid waste, but other places where we have occasion to probably use more scientific terms than most people um, are comfortable using. Um, and then I guess my second question is, um, what are our outside sources? Um, or what is kind of the matrix on, um, of style that we're, we're building our guide upon? Is it like the AP style guide? Um, or do you have a, a different reference point for us to start with? Great. So I think the first question, um, you wanted to know what our recommendations are for how we write uh, about technical language. Um, it's, it's, it's okay to use, you, you really have to write for your audience. So if your audience is, you know, if you're writing for garb, uh, what is it, um, waste, you know, <laughs> a specialist, they, they're familiar with that language. So it's, it's okay to, to use technical language if you're writing for the right audience. Um, if you're writing for a wider audience, uh, the, the standard is to use, use the term and define it. Um, and so you, you always want to def define those technical terms for people in a manner that is in plain language. Um, and if there's, you know, a less technical term for it, um, that's something else that we would encourage people to use. So, you know, for example, waste, you know, we could just say trash or garbage, you know, so the thing, things like that. There are plain language alternatives, more casual ways of speaking about it um, and then the other one was what what are we using as resources we're using a lot of resources so we um, 
we referenced a lot of our, of our research in the style guide. So we read uh, journals, we read books, we watched webinars, um, we read other inclusive language style guides from across um, the country, so at, at universities, at hospitals, of course the City of Oakland style guide. So um, there's a long list of, of references that, that helped to in, inform the style guide as well as interviews with our colleagues, so in-person interviews. Does that help answer your, uh, your question or? We, we do, uh, in general, for our, our regular normal writing style guide, we do um, use the AP style and we've adapted the AP style. There are, there are some things that we've, um, actually we've been ahead of the AP style. So for example, we've we, um, encouraged our staff to capitalize black. A couple of years later, the AP style, they gave out that guidance as well. So we've made adaptations um, and we've seen that society is moving in that direction as well. Great, thank you. The second part of that uh, answer is what my question was, as how we relate to the AP style guide or the other ones that are out there competing. And I'm glad that we're making our select edits or our select changes, but still have the, the backbone of, of that very uh, thorough guide. So That's thank you, uh, good work. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Craddock and then Councilor Gonzalez. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate this, consi this consideration. Um, obviously, this is uh, part, I would say, another arm of the inf influence of the racial equity strategy. And so it's, I have all, always have these aha moments about just how influential that strategy and policy is that we've adopted. And so thank you. It's really exciting to hear about this. And I, I would have never considered this. So I appreciate you bringing this before us. So, the, so it sounds like there's two things occurring simultaneously. Um, Shane, with the, your presentation and our vote today, this will begin to move us into, as we write code, really consider how that code is going to be written in real language. And I'm glad, really glad to see that. But it sounds like we've already, the departments have already adopted how they write in general. You know, for obviously there's many places, Metro has, prepares documents, um, you know, public out, you know, public, um, things that we put on our, on our internet, of course, public um, comments, support that staff give us, and then when we're out are working in, in um, meeting with the public. So it sounds like we're, two things are happening simultaneously with, this, uh, with the, the vote that we'll make today. One is already, you don't need our vote to do that, uh, but the other one is what you're working on is, of course, influencing the work that they, our, the Metro Attorney's Office does. So my question is, um, we have a lot of code. And um, <laughs> profusely, but I, I'd be interested to know how many pages of um, internet pages there are of code in the Metro uh, website. So I guess, how, how are you gonna put this in action? I, it's gonna take a long time, I would think. And so what is that plan? When, how long is it going to take to rewrite code? Uh, are you only gonna write it when a new code is coming before us and you have the opportunity to make modifications? So what's the action plan to make, get this done and moving out and change our code as you are presenting it to us. Thank you, Council Credit, for that question. And so there's a little bit more of the presentation that will discuss that just a, a, a tad, but to answer it very shortly, if, uh, if new code language is coming to Council for adoption, then the, this resolution instructs those who are bringing it forth to take the opportunity to look at the rest of the chapter of whatever you're working on and see if there are some low-hanging fruit that you can work on and get that updated at the same time you're bringing something forth that's new. So this doesn't require um, an audit of the entire code. It doesn't require all the departments to go back tomorrow and start redrafting code. That would be a monumental task. But it does ask them, going forward, write in a certain way, and then grab some of the current language when you have an opportunity to, to clean that up. Thank you. And I didn't know if there were further questions or if you wanted me to finish. Uh, is there another question? I, pending? Yes. Uh, yes, there are several. Okay. <laughs> Including me. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Gonzalez. All right, thanks. Um, well, I really admire this work. And um, you know, I'm sure that you know, everyone in this room, everyone on this dais, everyone watching can appreciate that um, communicating via writing is a lifelong journey of learning and unlearning and mastery and 
pros and all that. So, you know, kind of going through the, uh, the attachment and the report, I was like, you know, I'm just going to download this and put it on my phone file so I can always <laughs> go back to it. Um, but, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, the, the, the power of words you mentioned earlier, it can be used to, to harm, to oppress, and can use to, to liberate and create access. Um, and uh, similar to what Councilor Huang mentioned earlier, the, this kind of like this balance of implementing something for, you know, from here on out, 100% um, in support for, and then recognizing like Councilor Craddock mentioned and others have mentioned, there's just so much code, so much language, um, and that just kind of, you know, how, how much do we go back and, and fix all of it? And we should, and I want to, um, and also recognizing that, I mean, we're creating policy, creating rules all the time and, and that, you know, we have limited time, limited resources and where we apply that. But, you know, I welcome that, uh, conversation with our COO, um, and, and with our, uh, you know, obviously our amazing attorneys here, but, uh, a huge fan of the playing language movement. Um, and, um, yeah, I just thank you so much for bringing this forward and uh, making it a priority. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll let you go on, but I guess I just wanted to say it, it resonates with me because uh, as an engineer, it's used to make, you know, language um, terminology is used to make sure that people can't or feel uh, less than in terms of their knowledge base, right? And it, it has part of my life's journey to just, you need to listen to people's different perspectives. It's not just technical, it's not just data. You can't just wow people with data. Um, you have to actually figure out how that, what that means to a person. So it resonates for me there. I guess, um, well, totally supportive, so don't take any of this the wrong way. Um, because it's kind of on the bleeding edge of moving forward, what is our, uh, what is our best practice review process going to be as we make this part of our everyday before before we share it with other jurisdictions before we share it like how are we literally dotting our eyes crossing our t's to make sure that we've we've got a perspective i mean you've named a lot of good resources and i'm just wondering is has anybody gone through a review process that we could also do before we say hey this has been totally vetted. It's right. It's top notch. We've gotten check marks. I don't know. Thank you for your question, Council uh, President Peterson. Um, so, as, as I mentioned, that is a, sharing it with other jurisdictional partners is aspirational. Like we're, we're not. We're nowhere near that yet. The the inclusive language style guide is discussed regularly. We get. We regularly get questions from colleagues who are asking us, how do we write about mm -hmm. um, this topic or this community of people? And that is telling us how we need to improve mm -hmm. our existing inclusive language style guide. So we're, we're actively taking notes. Um, I, I have a list going of new topics that we want to add, topics that we want to um, improve um, and, and expand. So for example, most one of the most recent examples is we were asked to um, guide on, on how to talk about historically marginalized communities. And so we ha we've had multiple discussions with our colleagues in communications about how, how to give that guidance. So we, we've got a, a guidance in the inclusive style guide, but clearly we, we're, we're learning that that entry needs to be expanded with more examples and we're actually work workshopping that very entry um, continuing to work workshop it this afternoon at our editorial uh, meeting so it's it's something that we it's really part of our like everyday copy editing copy writing and um, our goal is to like update it at least once a year but that once a year, it's it's like ongoing work. Like every yeah. month, every week, we're, we're, it's, 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 a ma it's a discussion point. Yeah. Uh, and it will continue to be for quite and some time. And it will continue, yeah. yes, yeah. I guess m my point was just, um, at, at some point, we're going to want to share this with more than just internal. And um, I'm a, just a big believer of outside eyes. Definitely. Right? Yes. Just an, an, another set of perspectives to 
challenge assumptions. Yes. Right? Because we all have inherent assumptions that we make about stuff. And, and so it's just being able to have that conversation with outside eyes and say, okay, before we, you know, either require it or uh, share it. Absolutely. Awesome. That we, so that, that is one of the things that we intended to do before the pandemic started. Yeah. We were going to <laughs> take these entries. Um, we were going to uh, schedule community forums and um, workshop individual entries with people that we serve in the region. So not language experts, you know, but people who yeah. have, who are experts in, of, of their life, of their experience living, um, living in this region. So once we finish, or once we, once we get there, once we vet it with people that we serve in the region, then we would feel comfortable sharing it with jurisdictional partners and saying like, we have, you know, this list of people in the community who've read this, who've given us corrections, who've shaped the, the changes that, that we've made and, and, and who are going to continue to be a part of the, of the, of the reviews in the future too. Yeah. We'll need them. Right, that's exciting. Right, all right, move on to the next. Thank you, Amber. As I mentioned earlier, this resolution does two things. As we've already discussed, it incorporates plain and inclusive language best practices into the Metro Code. But second, it also directs the COO to establish a schedule for Metro Code housekeeping updates. When new code sections are added or old ones repealed, sometimes this creates non-existent or misnumbered cross-references. Sometimes department or staff titles change and the code doesn't get updated. Sometimes references to state statutes get outdated. And sometimes individuals or regulated entities highlight to staff certain code sections that are not clear or somewhat amb and, uh, ambiguous. And staff agrees with them, they're right. For these reasons, a well-maintained code needs regular housekeeping updates. And ideally, regulatory code chapters like solid waste and our income taxes should be updated annually to keep current. Now, I'm a little bit of a nerd in that I love doing code housekeeping updates. <laughs> Nothing gets me more excited than fixing a cross-reference. I love it. But a lot of people don't. And so this resolution creates a bit of a gentle push to require them to take a look at their code chapters and do some updates on uh, some sort of a regular schedule. And we are uh, the, the resolution defers to the COO to establish what is an appropriate schedule for that. And that kind of goes to the questions that we received as how are you going to implement this in the long run. And so at the end of the day, um, I want to be clear that these code housekeeping updates would not be substantive revisions. They would, for example, just correct a cross-reference, improve readability, or perhaps remove an ambiguity. Think of it like spring cleaning. All we're doing is getting rid of the cobwebs in the code. This ends our presentation. The Metro Attorney's Office recommends that Council adopt Resolution 22-5293 to require plain and inclusive language best practices when drafting code language, and to also require appropriate code housekeeping updates when necessary. And now we're happy to answer any further questions you may have. <laughs> and we do. Councilor Nolan. Thanks, Madam President. And um, Shane, your last comments actually lead into one of the questions I had, and that is filters on substantive change. Because words have synonyms or um, mates or matches that almost mean the same thing. So when we change them, even if we're not intending to make a policy decision, we may be. And so it, it, I sort of echo President Peterson's question about who's vetting it to make sure that there isn't an inadvertent substantive change. Just for example, the, the first phrase you opened up with, the word shall. Do we replace it with will? Do we replace it with intend to? Do we replace it with must? Do we replace it with is obligated to? Um, how, I'm interested in where those decisions get made. So this is a great question, and of course, with your uh, background as a legislator, you know exactly how th th this how important words can be in a statute, and small changes can have unintended effects. You know that, and we know that as well. This is intended to try and 
it's a fine line and it's a bit of a judgment call I'm gonna I mean if I'm being honest with you what we're looking for is to try and do house tr true housekeeping changes that do not and change the intent shall is a great example it's that's why I hate the word shall and never use it because of the fact that it can be may should must will and and it really depends on what the intent is what are you saying I, f I feel like from myself being a regulatory code attorney for many, many years that I have a, I have a good sense of our regulatory codes and what the intent is. But we, we're looking f more for being able to come to counsel and to counsel to be, um, to find it normalized that you would receive updates on occasion, mm -hmm. pure housekeeping updates. And I think that sometimes there are, there's a reluctance to go to counsel. You're very busy. You have a lot of things on your plate. And so to bring these ordinances forth, they require two readings and a lot of work. But it really is important. And I think that's why sometimes it, things don't get updated, is there's a reluctance to bring it before you. As far as the vetting goes, open to suggestions, Councillor Nolan, as to whether with solid waste, if we're doing anything that's in any way substantive, of course, we vet that with our regulated entities and our franchisees and licensees and our solid waste directors, local government directors. So we try and do a lot of vetting. But what this is hoping to address is more pure mistakes, cross-reference mistakes. Those are easy. But there is a little bit of a judgment call if you're changing a paragraph or a sentence to try and make it cleaner and easier to read but will it have the unintended consequence of changing the intent? And I don't know how to address that other than sending everything out for review, which um, from a housekeeping standpoint would gum up the process a little bit. So happy to, uh, if you have some suggestions on how you think we should go about that, but really the intent would be not to change the substantive intent. If I might follow up, um, and I don't have the answer, but I'm very familiar with what we call the Scribner's Bill, which would be that thick in paper um, when we adopted it every biennial session in the legislature. It did exactly what you're talking about. It tempted to go back and, you know, update cross references and and do that. Um, so there's some history there, and maybe just a consultation with legislative council about how they do that and what they do when they run into words that could be interpreted differently, how do they choose when going to plain language which of the plain language phrases to substitute for an archaic legal one? Um, I'm all, I, I should have started with this, I think the inclusive language is a fabulous initiative and fully behind it. Making our documents accessible to the public also a very important goal. Um, I'm hearing something though that gives me a little bit of trouble, and that is maybe a technical section of the code could continue to use technical terms that the general public understands, but other parts of the code we need to have in plain language, sixth grade level, I don't know what your standard is. Um, can you talk to me a bit about whether we're going to have different standards for different sections of the code? Is this my, my question? You or uh, Carrie? I, Carrie, if you want me to toss this to you. <laughs> I'll let Shane go first yeah. I'd like to add. No, I don't Thank think you. there should be different standards. As, Amber noted there are times when technical terms are necessary and some of our code, especially in the solid waste world, uh, parrots a lot of what you see in DEQ, state statute, and so it wouldn't make sense for us to change it in a way that's not changed at the state level and then there'd be a, a bit of a disconnect and that could cause confusion. So technical terms uh, are acceptable at times. Uh, I don't believe there should be different standards. If you look through our code, if you were to look at all of our entire metro code, you'll see well, they, it was written at different times, and so some of it's mm -hmm. kind of oh, really yeah. wonky and kind of difficult to read, and some of it's a little bit cleaner. It depends on who wrote it and when, and when that occurred. So I would, I would favor a consistent standard, and I don't know if it's the 6th grade reading level or the 10th grade, but it should be readable. We should, everyone we would like to think should be able to read our code and understand what that paragraph or that sentence meant. And I think we can do a much better job at times in cleaning that kind of thing up, just from a clarity standpoint of writing. I don't know if I'm answering your question about a sixth grade level or a tenth grade level or what standard, but I think the standard should be uh, the same throughout the code as far as readability, accessibility, clarity, brevity. And 
certainly there should be one. I pulled out sixth grade because that's typically the standard for health-related communications. Um, one final comment, if I might, um, Madam President. Um, as you go through this, and I applaud the idea of a regular review, um, it is tedious, but words matter. And so putting the effort into scrubbing through on an annual or biannual basis makes sense to me. When you do that, as you review things, I would request as a council member who would be voting on the changes you propose through that review that are intended not to be substantive, for you to have within your re internal review group um, kind of the loyal opposition who says, whose job it is to identify places where we might be creating ambiguity as we're solving one other problem. And if you have discussions among yourselves about which phrase or word should we use to substitute for what's currently there, if there's a discussion or debate because reasonable people disagree, that sort of event should be highlighted to us so that we know where you came down in what you're recommending. Thanks for the effort. Thanks for the initiative. I enjoy the geekiness, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, Councillor Lewis, then, oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Craddock, then Councillor Lewis, then uh, Councillor Rosenthal. Thank you. I just want to, uh, I've already asked this question, but I just want to confirm. So that you, this ordinance adopts a schedule. The chief operating officer will initiate. So it, who's the watchdog on this to see that it occurs? Is that the Metro Attorney's Office? Then that will see that, is any new codes coming forward that there will be this, uh, the language will be reviewed and is being done. It, it authorizes the COO to develop a schedule as appropriate for the different departments. Some departments, as I said, solid waste or income tax, they probably need more annual updates than the parks code. So I would, but it still would fall under the COO for the, to, to develop the schedule. And then to make sure that's being done though. <laughs> Is the, does the buck stop with the Metro Attorney's Office? Council? Yes, um, uh, uh, Councilor Craddock, Metro Attorney is involved in drafting and reviewing the code. And so we take this as direction from Council that when we're doing so, we are reviewing not just for substance, but also for plain language and for inclusive language. Um, and I would just add to that, I commend the suggestions made by Councilor Nolan that we need to highlight where there is discussion because that helps bring clarity as to whether or not there's substantive changes or just housekeeping changes. Thank you. Great. Councilor Lewis and then Councilor Rosenthal. Sure. I just have a statement um, in response to uh, Shane mentioning that uh, there is a perception of our perceived busyness and the challenge of getting in front of us and attention to code. Um, even though it is dry, even though it may not have a political urgency that some of our other work does, I would say my preference would be never wait, never hesitate, but work with us on code immediately and when it's necessary. Um, I'm, I'm personally not too busy to talk about code. It is something that we are uniquely positioned to work on. Um, so just wanted to kind of let folks know that um, there is definitely a, uh, a a willingness to do this work, at least on 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 my front. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. Yeah, I was gonna say something later, but I'll just say ditto. Um, it <laughs> it's it um, if we don't know that this work is going on uh, and nobody asks us to prioritize it, then we're not going to. <laughs> Um, and I think that's true of, of, you know, a lot of different topics. Um, if council doesn't know it's actually happening and uh, nobody comes forward to ask us for uh, what is the priority, can you, can you get this going, uh, then it will not happen. And it should not be perceived as a uh, we don't care. It's we literally don't know everybody's job. And we don't know the barriers. And we don't know, you know how, how hard you're working on this very specific thing that's so important to the entire organization until it's brought forward. So thank you for bringing it forward. <laughs> but I think, I think it's good to just repeat that over and over again. Um, literally don't know everybody's job. Thank you. Wish I could do everybody's <laughs> job, but can't. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Rosenthal and then Wong. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. I'll say ditto to the same thing, that don't, don't be afraid to bring to Council questions when you have issues like that. We should be prepared to look at those. I particularly like the idea of the gentle nudge of the departments to do this when it's appropriate. I think that's important. And then I have to comment that considering English is, or American, is probably the most fungible, flexible, and fluid language going in the world, um, this job is probably going to be redone and redone as time goes by by different councils. It's not, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. It's, you're never going to be quite done. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wong. Thank you, Madam President. And, you know, just reflecting on the conversation and kind of the value that we have around accessibility and, um, you know, it, it, advancing kind of transparency. I really encourage our CEO's office and all the leadership here at Metro to really think about this as part of a broader culture shift that we're seeing and undertaking here at Metro. And, you know, this might be a piece about words and language, but I think the broader values that we're hoping to drive forward needs to be, you know, more, uh, more front and center. And I would encourage our leadership to you know, have some really deep conversations. You know, I think when we have a style guide, you might be hearing from folks that are like interested because they believe in that value set and want to advance it, but you know, you might not be hearing from folks that don't. Um, so just like how do we build that broader understanding that we need to have you know, as part of our overall culture. Great, thank you. Uh, I see uh, Marisa Madrigal, our COO, coming forward. Did you want to say something? Yes, thank you, uh, Council President Peterson, and good, good morning, or almost afternoon, Councilors. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been sitting here and uh, COVID, pro COVID probation uh, listening, and uh, I just wanted to, to voice, because I can't, um, you know, look you in the eye in the, in the room there, that um, myself and my team, you know, fully support the inclusive language guide, um, which I understand was, was actually put in place um, prior to my my tenure here, um, and uh, we we agree that it is um, part of a larger cultural change. Um, you know, I've always believed that um, you know government is us. Government is is community and and people. And if we have materials and code and things that are inaccessible um, because of technical language, because of poorly written language, because of you know whatever whatever the cause. Um, or, or even language that's alienating um, because it's racist or because it's sexist, um, that we have a duty to, um, to fix that. And I think all of the efforts that we, we make at Metro from diversifying our workforce to building cultural competency feed into these efforts. Um, you know, uh, the internal work that we're doing with our workforce is going to improve the outcomes of this work. Um, because it's going to have a more diverse set of perspectives that feed into the ultimate recommendations to you. So um, I just wanted to to pop up and and uh, voice my um, full hearted support for this work. And um, I, as Shane said, he's a nerd. I am too. <laughs> I am looking forward to uh, bringing these uh, these things forward in partnership with OMA. Thank you. Great, and thank you uh, for moving this forward and supporting it. All right, counselors, uh, looking back at the resolution, uh, do we have a motion on resolution number 22-5293 for the purpose of incorporating inclusive and plain language best practices in Metro code and establishing code updates as appropriate? Move approval. Been moved by Councillor Gonzalez and seconded by Councillor Rosenthal. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, Counter, will you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, President Peterson. Uh, Councillor Wong? Uh, aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Nolan? Yes. Councillor Rosenthal? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Craddock? Aye. And President Peterson. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you and congratulations um, for all the work you get to do. <laughs> this is, it's, it's an amazing move forward, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Under other business today, we have uh, Margie Bradway here for an update on the draft regional mobility policy measures and implementation plan for 2023. Um, and uh, Councilors, as you recall, the regional mobility policy helps the region make choices about transportation needs, where to focus resources, and how to manage the transportation system today and into the future. Margie, you want to kick us off? Yeah, good morning, maybe good afternoon. I'm Margie Bradway. She, hers, uh, Deputy Director of the Planning, Development, and Research Department. Um, the irony does not fall short on me for talking about the mobility policy, which is an extremely technical issue after that great discussion about using plain language and inclusive language. Um, but we are, do our best to use plain language. In fact, on this project, I just want to shout out to Molly Kunzer Mesker, our comms person, who has worked incredibly hard over the course of this two year, two and a half year project to use plain language and outreach um, to get input. So today we bring you the final draft recommendations for the mobility policy update. We kicked off this project, we started to scope it in 2019, I remember because we were in the chambers at the time. Um, and at that time we knew it was what we were tackling a big issue. Um, and I'll say today what I said back then, which is this, the mobility policy is the most important policy in transportation, but the least understood. It touches everything um, from development code to capital projects to plans to transportation system plans, for example. Um, the current policy in our region and the current policy in our state and much across the United States is to measure mobility by level of service of vehicles. So simply how many vehicles can you get through? It's also called the vehicle to capacity ratio. Um, do you have enough room for your vehicles? That's it. That's what we were using for decades to build our transportation system. I am extremely proud uh, to bring you and our team and the work. Uh, it's been a true partnership with ODOT. We've stayed together. The project team met over 100 times, including ODOT headquarters and ODOT Region 1. Our consultants stayed with us. Their fabulous consultant team uh, at Kittleson. Shout out to Susie Wright, who is our primary consultant, as well as every single one of our cities and counties. We held 10 technical workshops on this issue that were well attended. We usually hold one workshop. So that gives you a sense of how complex this issue is. But TPAC and the cities and counties, the technical coordinating committee spent an incredible amount of time bringing you today what are three alternative measures uh, that Kim is going to talk about that measure mobility based on vehicle miles travels reduced, measure mobility based on reliability, and measure mobility based on the completeness of our system. So with no further ado, of course, at the helm, the hardworking and persistent Kim Ellis, principal planner. Please take it from here, Kim. I can't see you, but I can see yes. your slide. Are you there? Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, there you go. Great. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, thank you, President Peterson and, and Metro Council. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to be here today. Uh, Glenn Boland from, from ODOT Region 1. Uh, is also joining me on the panel. Uh, next slide, please, Nathan. Uh, and we are asking for a recommendation from the Metro Council uh, to support um, the recommendation that the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation made uh, last month uh, to basically uh, forward this draft policy uh, into the Regional Transportation Plan for further testing and refinement. Uh, so this is not a final action uh, on the policy. It's just, uh, allowing staff to move forward and bringing it into uh, the regional transportation plan update next year and to continue uh, to develop it. And we'll be bringing back uh, a final policy as part of the uh, regional transportation plan adoption package uh, at the end of next year. Uh, next slide. Uh, I won't cover um, um, a, a lot of what Margie just uh, described, but uh, a couple points that I want to uh, highlight um, that uh, uh, she didn't cover is not only are we updating how we define and measure mobility to be much more comprehensive and aligned with our goals for the transportation system and other outcomes we're trying to achieve, 
uh, the, the policy lives uh, in the regional transportation plan, but also the Oregon Highway Plan and Policy 1F. And so uh, uh, upon um, approval or adoption of a final policy in the regional transportation plan, we will also be uh, forwarding that to the Oregon Transportation Commission uh, for their consideration as part of an amendment or the update to the Oregon Highway Plan um, following that. Next slide. Uh, I just want to re-emphasize too that this is really uh, a, a, a transformational new policy, uh, a new way that really brings together um, our land use goals, uh, our, our goals for expanding transportation options, and also our goals for having a safe, reliable system for people, goods, and services, not just um, motor vehicles. And so that is what this policy is aiming to do, building on the policy work uh, that we did uh, as part of developing the 2018 Regional Transportation Plan. This also aligns very strongly with uh, uh, the Oregon Transportation Commission and work that they've been doing on their strategic action plan priorities. Uh, they have identified those same goals uh, in the work that they are doing, and it's very aligned also with more recent work um, by the Department of Land Conservation and Development and their Land Conservation and Development Commission uh, to update uh, the transportation planning rules. So this work really aligns our region, uh, the Regional Transportation Plan and uh, local TSPs, transportation system plans uh, to, uh, to support uh, and begin implementing those, those new rules. Uh, next slide. This is the timeline, so it's been quite a journey. Uh, we've done a lot of work. I had a lot of discussions, as, as Margie said, uh, and um, that just, just highlights that there. Next slide. And, uh, and the policy, as Margie said, uh, really does, uh, it applies at the system plan level or when we're doing corridor or area plans to help identify where there may be needs or deficiencies uh, in the transportation system. So now, uh, instead of looking at just the vehicles uh, through going through a corridor or facility uh, in that long range plan, we'll be looking at what are the vehicle miles traveled per capita um, impacts, what are, uh, how can we uh, better complete the system uh, for all modes of travel, walking, biking, transit, as well as uh, vehicle travel as well as looking at the reliability of our throughway system uh, through using uh, the, the travel measure, that travel speed measure that I'll describe. It will also uh, guide how and direct how we're evaluating changes to our land use plans uh, in the future, um, um, in particular local governments when they're updating their comprehensive plans uh, under the transportation planning rule, they're required to evaluate the impacts of those land use changes on the transportation system. And so with this uh, new policy, as we uh, finalize it, uh, it will look at, uh, uh, again, vehicle miles travel per capita, how complete is the transportation system in the area in which the land use changes are happening, and then are there effects on uh, the reliability uh, of the transportation, of the throughway system uh, uh, that ODOT owns. Uh, next slide. This shows all of those um, discussions that we've had over the past three years. Uh, and really, it has been more than three years because we scoped it in 2019. Uh, following the 2018 uh, RTP, uh, we started with more than 100 measures. We narrowed down to about 40 last year as we were developing uh, what was important for this uh, policy to, to be considering. Uh, and then over the past year, uh, we've continued to do research, get feedback, refine, uh, and we've also developed an action plan uh, that was included uh, in your packet. And uh, there is an attachment three uh, of your packet it has a, um, a, a more in-depth summary of, of all the engagement uh, work that we've done. Uh, next slide. So last year, uh, Council and, and uh, JPACT uh, uh, agreed and supported um, this draft de definition of mobility for the Portland area, and also that these six elements uh, should be uh, addressed as part of the policy, uh, considering equity, uh, accessibility of the transportation system, uh, efficiency of how we're planning and implementing our land use and transportation system, reliability, uh, safety uh, and expanded travel options. Uh, next slide. 
And uh, through that, uh, the, these are the six draft policies uh, uh, by um, supporting moving this forward. These six policies, uh, we would begin integrating them into chapter three uh, of the draft 2023 regional transportation plan, uh, along with other policy work that is being uh, developed uh, as part of the, uh, the regional transportation plan update. Uh, so that will this will come back to you in the form of these policies uh, being integrated in a draft form uh, in that tra uh, transportation plan for further discussion uh, and refinement uh, uh, next year. And next slide. In addition, um, these are the three measures um, uh, that I uh, described a little bit uh, that uh, we would be bringing into the regional transportation plan as well next year. And uh, we will be using these as part of the system evaluation that we'll be doing uh, uh, in January. We'll begin working with our local partners, state agencies, TriMet, and SMART to update the project priorities uh, of the RTP. And these measures will help us evaluate uh, that overall uh, performance of the plan. So we'll be looking at uh, the VMT, vehicle miles travel per capita reduction. Uh, the targets uh, that we have identified uh, for this are aligned with the targets that have been mandated by the state under the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking uh, that are directing uh, our region to meet these reduction targets by those dates uh, to be on track to meet the broader uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals uh, that the state has uh, asked of us. Uh, on the system completeness measure, uh, the targets are to plan and complete a plan network. So in the regional transportation plan, we have uh, plan networks for all parts of the system uh, for uh, transit, uh, bicycle, uh, pedestrian travel, the motor vehicle network, our freight network, as well as our transportation system management and operations network where um, uh, these are the priority areas. Uh, for investment in the system and uh, working to build a complete and connected multimodal transportation system. And likewise, local governments have uh, these uh, types of networks uh, defined uh, in their transportation system plans. And so the evaluation work uh, that would happen would be how, um, where are there gaps in the system that need to be completed uh, as part of uh, any of the future planning or um, those comprehensive plan amendments that I mentioned. And then the third measure is a reliability measure. Um, and this is new and we'll need to continue to do some more work that's identified in the action plan. Uh, but essentially the, the new measure uh, is looking at um, freeway speed and, uh, um, uh, and um, to ensure or to uh, monitor measure uh, how many hours uh, of the day of a 24 hour day uh, that uh, the throughway speeds fall below 35 miles an hour. And this is for the interstate system uh, in the region. Uh, there are other uh, throughways that are designated in the regional transportation plan. Uh, we have a draft uh, target. Uh, and this again is to identify deficiencies or needs um, uh, of those facilities based on these specials, but for those other throughways that have signals uh, or not limited access, um, the, the speed target is 20 miles per hour. We will be bringing back, uh, working with TPAC and the Metro Technical Advisory Committee further uh, on this. Uh, there is some technical aspects that we will have to work through on how we measure it. And I also want to note that um, simply not meeting these thresholds does not mean that the solution is always a capacity solution. Uh, the policy directs that we're following our congestion management process that is looking at uh, uh, addressing uh, these deficiencies and other ways before uh, adding capacity. So it's really taking a comprehensive approach uh, to, to how we're uh, evaluating uh, that performance and potential solutions to address uh, those identified needs. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a high level overview uh, of the action plan uh, that was included as part of the, the packet. Uh, and it just shows that um, this, uh, this has been a big body of work to get to where we are now. And there's still a lot of work left um, uh, to implement it uh, once it's finalized, uh, but we'll continue developing it and other supporting guidance and tools and uh, data uh, next year as part of the regional transportation plan update. Uh, in 2024, uh, pending adoption by JPAC and the Metro Council next fall, 
Uh, we would forward it to the Oregon Transportation Commission. Uh, we would also need to bring uh, uh, to council uh, future amendments to the Regional Transportation Functional Plan. Uh, that is uh, our code for the Regional Transportation Plan and directs how local governments implement uh, the Regional Transportation Plan as well as developing further guidance. And then uh, beyond 2024, uh, and, and in some cases, concurrent with uh, the work in 2024, th there's just continued data development, uh, implementation uh, at the local level, and then also updating um, guidelines, procedures, best practices uh, at the state and local level, which is what really directs how this is implemented uh, at the state level and uh, in ODOT's work, as well as uh, at the local level and local transportation plans and, and comprehensive planning. Uh, next slide. I also want to uh, just acknowledge that um, uh, something that I said at the beginning that this work really intersects with a lot of statewide work, state level work that's been happening, the climate friendly, equitable communities rulemaking. Uh, ODOT is also uh, in the process of uh, updating the Oregon Transportation Plan. Councilor Gonzalez is a part uh, of that work and representing the Metro Council. Uh, the Oregon Highway Plan will also begin being updated uh, next year. And so um, uh, along with the RTP update and this project, and uh, what I want to acknowledge is not just the intersection of these, but a lot of the same staff that have been working uh, in ODOT on this work are going to be involved in those statewide efforts for the Oregon Transportation Plan and the Oregon Highway Plan. And we'll be carrying forward what we've learned through this work to those efforts uh, to help um, help uh, advance uh, this policy within the context of those updates. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, again, uh, today we're asking for Metro Council support um, of JPAC's recommendation uh, to move this forward uh, into the RTP. There's a lot of lingo language in there in that uh, recommendation, um, but um, but essentially that's what the, the action will be, and we'll be continuing to work with Metro Council and JPAC uh, through the RTP process. Uh, next slide. And that process is just highlighted there. Uh, it's also described a bit more uh, in the staff report. So I will um, uh, stop there and turn it to you, Council President Peterson, for questions. Thank you. Um, Margie, could you just uh, clarify, uh, this is under other business. There is no formal adoption of this at this point. I just want to clarify, um, this is just looking for head nods and uh, general agreement of the right direction. Correct support. It um, After a lot of discussion with attorneys and staff, we, um, <laughs> and all, this has been thought and I, thought and I had no idea there was that much conversation yes, behind the scenes. Um, but I just, conversation. In plain English. <laughs> we, in, in plain English, we are, we decided the best course was do the formal adoption within the RTP because the mobility policy is a part of it. So today we are asking for your support and a head nod and, and, um, and that's to what I was clarifying incorporate what, it into the 2020. And that's why I was clarifying yes. support. There's no, there's actually no formal motion of support. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> and I, I could have clarified that in my speech in the beginning. It is, it feels, it feels like the final step to us, but the final, <laughs> final step is when you gavel down on the RTP. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, we've had a lot of presentations um, leading up to this. Uh, we uh, saw a draft uh, language for those three alternate methods and the next steps. Um, counselors, do you have any technical questions, or policy questions for uh, Margie and Kim at this time? Councilor Credit. I don't know if I'd call it a technical question, but a curiosity question. Um, so first two. So the first one is uh, regarding the Oregon Highway Plan uh, is Kim presented, that's going to be updated. So does that mean this mobility policy will be implemented throughout the entire state of Oregon when they update the Oregon Highway Plan? Councilor Craddock, that's an excellent question. The answer is no, it will only pertain to the Portland region, but it will be incorporated. So currently there is a alternative mobility policy still based on level of service, but it's a modified one, and it carves out the Portland metro region. That, that chart that's currently in the OHP is almost 20 years old. We are updating that chart, so we will have an alternative mobility standards for the Portland region under the recognition that we are different. 
we're more dense, we have more traffic, we have more people, and so on. So we don't have support yet uh, to um, make this a statewide plan. I, I no, there's not right now, although I will say the same team that is working on the Oregon Highway Plan was on our project team. Yeah, they're very involved watching and participating in our work closely. Um, and I, in terms of kind of communication, Amanda Peets, who's head of the policy and planning group at ODOT, is briefing all the OTC commissioners, and we do expect some kind of formal action as part of their work on OHP and OATP. Good. I have a second question. Go ahead. So um, I, you know, I know the general influence that this policy have. It's pretty significant. I'm really, of course, very pleased with it. But I, I, the question, I guess, is more uh, every day for the everyday person is, What's going to be different in our built environment when this policy begins to be implemented? What, as new construction occurs, as cities adopt new um, RTP or TSPs, what's going to be different? How will the, what will you see that will be a little different? I know we're going to, freeway system will slightly be monitored differently, but what else, what else would, is going to be happening with this policy that, in a visual way? Yeah, great. And um, uh, oh, I hear Kim. Kim, would you like to speak well, was, to this? Well, I was going to uh, offer an opportunity for Glenn to. Oh, uh, okay. Um, just so he can have an opportunity to, to to speak as well. Of course. Hi, Glenn. Didn't mean to leave you out. No, no. Uh, for those who don't know me, Glenn Boland, principal planner with ODOT Region One, Peronsky and him. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think uh, so. Yeah, Councilor Kader, great question. This is one of those very multifaceted. I'll hit a couple of, of points. Um, I mentioned it, I think we might have been there during JPAC, but um, for example, right now we are working with the Bureau of uh, Planning Services in Portland um, who are looking to create more housing options in the Southwest Portland Town Center. Um, the vehicle-based standard is a barrier to some of the things that they want to accomplish. So from a land use standpoint, you're, you're going to be not, um, it'll be easier to create new housing options in the right places where we have these, uh, you know, ur urban settings. So that, that's, uh, I think, one. The other place where this really come in um, for transportation planners is as they're updating the transportation system plans, we often find ourselves at a point where, oh no, this intersection, that intersection, we can't make it meet the vehicle standard. So what do we do? Well, now we have a guide map. We have, a, we have a path forward here that says, oh, that's not what you're supposed to do in these cases. Here's what you're supposed to do. Let's get the network connectivity that's in the functional plan, which is block lengths to get good crossings and more, more travel options. Let's get the sidewalks. Let's get the bike lanes. Let's get the transit service. And in many cases, these are things that we do as planners as we're trying to solve these things, but it codifies them as like, hey, this is the way to do it. So those are two big aspects, changes in land use. Places like Lake Oswego, Tiger, others who, who um, have congested arterials can now have a better path for increased housing and job opportunities in those areas because they don't have this limit. And then as we do system plans, we change the way we prioritize what we're going to um, be putting into plans and ultimately funding. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And then, Glenn, those are some great planning examples. Um, on the capital side, as this works its way down through the system, I think what what this, this will allow is more context sensitive design. Really, um, if you look, or I, I could use TV Highway. I actually remember being out on TV Highway physically at one point and thinking this is the most overbuilt interchange I've ever seen, right? Because it takes so long. Councilor Gonzalez is smiling because it's so sad you gotta laugh sometimes, right? Because it's so wide and it's so long for the pedestrian to travel while well, the old standard was a vehicle to capacity standard. So you would just build out your capacity as much as you think you needed. A new standard on our trails would be a complete street standard. What do you need to make the street complete? How you can facilitate the pedestrian movement. So it lets you do that type of design, ideally. It allows you to make trade-offs easier. Correct, trade-offs easier between vehicle movement and pedestrian design because you're looking at the system in a complete way. Thank you. Councilor Rosenthal. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have a 
a comment on a couple of questions. First of all, it seems that we're going to have to get rid of the term freeway because we're rapidly moving into a situation where we have tollways rather than freeways. I mean, that's just reality. <laughs> and freeway is a method of paying for it, which is designed by the, you know, years ago. But my, quite, my first question is, some, I, I'm always a little confused when ODOT uses the terms throughways and expressways. Now, I'm assuming from this terminology here that a throughway is an expressway that has lights. That's sort of what it implies, but that's, that's what some of the terminology in here implies. So, and my question really is how much of a, there's quite a bit of difference between a 75% uh, speed, which is 41 and a half miles an hour, and the 35 speed. So this is a substantial change, and I'm just wondering if that caused any great problems. And then, so you, you can address the definition if there's some clarity that's going to be in there to really make it clear what's a free, what's a tollway, what's a throughway, and what's an expressway. Yeah. So a um, couple of things, Kim, and then I'm going to hand it off to you. Just big picture, so everybody's following us. Um, throughway is a term of art that's from metro. That is a metro regional transportation term, and it does apply to the interstate system. Anything that is a interstate, um, I'm not, expressway is not actually in our book, so I'm not, that's a, that's a um, informal term. Um, you had a question regarding what we call the reliability measure. That is, in just so everybody's following, what we are suggesting is to apply a reliability measure on the throughways only. So this does not apply to arterials or local roads, but it was what makes most sense when you have mostly vehicles coming through. We knew level of service was not the right measure, and there was a lot of incredible good technical work to say what we're really aiming for is a reliable system that we know we can get through at a reliable speed. So that's what you're asking questions about. And Kim, would you like to answer how we arrived at the 35 mile an hour in terms of a goal for reliability? Well, it was, um Yes, one clarification I would like to make just on the throughway de definition first is that the throughways are uh, intended to serve longer distance trips, Correct. you know, a regional and statewide function. And so it does, a, it is applied to the interstates, um, which are limited access. So grade separated interchanges, you don't have signals um, that you have uh, interchanges and grade separation. But it also applies to some other facilities that over time uh, have been envisioned to serve those longer distance trips. And an example of that that has signals, Council of Rosenthal, is 224 from downtown Milwaukee to Highway 2 um, Interstate I-205. Like that does serve a longer distance uh, regional and uh, state trips, but it has signals at limited intersections. Uh, and so that is something that we will need to look at a little bit further uh, of the appropriateness of that throughway designation for some of those routes and, and do further research. But the 35 mile an hour threshold came from really looking at uh, what is that um, tipping point of where the system uh, begins to begin to break down to utter failure and 35, 30 to 35 mile an hour was that based on the analysis that that Kittleson and associates did and what it showed was that um, that once you hit that um, your that speed you're also getting pretty good uh, throughput uh, it, as it as the system is performing but once it drops below uh, those uh, thresholds then there's a lot more basically it breaks down totally and a, a lot more congestion. So we're trying to use that as a, a point in which we, there's, uh, there's trouble, there's, there's a deficiency that we need to be looking at. Um, you know, what is causing that? What are some potential solutions to help, um, help uh, improve uh, that reliability uh, without um, uh, over, over emphasizing speed? And I don't know, Glenn, if you'd like to add um, more to that. It is not a speed limit. That's a different right. thing. Yeah, it's not a speed limit or a speed target, but it's really trying to identify where is there a deficiency that we need to be um, studying further, uh, understanding what's happening, and identifying uh, potential solutions um, that um, are the whole gamut of solutions, transit, uh, as well as uh, other, not just capacity, motor vehicle capacity. 
I yes, just, I, 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 just a comment that it seems to make sense from a, from a, I mean, I've driven on a lot of freeways and a lot of congested areas. And it makes sense from a, from a travel standpoint. It also implies, the standard also implies that roads like um, Highway 99W then would be on a 20 mile an hour definition for congestion. In other words, if speeds go below 20 miles an hour for a certain period. And is that correct? Because that would be a, a, a lighted throughway or a, a one, an ex, I'm not sure exactly Can't, what you call it. Um, I want to get this question answered. I think uh, probably more information and maybe a conversation with staff um, to get into the details. Today we're, we're trying to just give a head nod and moving forward with these policies. And I, I, I know you're trying to drill down, so I, I don't want to stop that. But um, if, if we want to go any further into depth, um, maybe, Margie, can you work and, and see if there's more, more information you can provide? Good. Yeah, that's that's fine. But I mean, I think some some clarity about terminology is 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 necessary to yeah. give a final yeah. we, head when we get to the RTP. Yeah, we'll get you. A, there's a term sheet of definitions, and we'll get through that as well as background information on the reliability measure. And again, the reliability measure, we're only talking really about the interstate system because that's where people are trying to move through. Uh, we suggested for the arterial system, and I believe 99W is an arterial that we look at complete streets and reducing BMT because we have other goals for those systems besides moving through when we're on those roadways. Good. Is that, is that good for now? That, that's good for now. I had one other little minor question, but that I'll ask that offline. Oh, you put it on the record. <laughs> now, in, in one of the goals, there seemed to be a word missing, and I just couldn't figure out what word it goes into it. And the goal says, have a direct something for system planning. And I, relevance, uh, I just was wondering what word supp was supposed to fit in there. Kim, are you familiar with which word? I don't. It's goals, it's policy goal six. And I just, uh, targets have a direct blank for system planning. And I was just wondering if there was a word that I should be putting in there. Uh, I believe that direct should be out, targets for system planning. So the word direct should be removed. Okay. Sure. Should read use mobility performance measures and targets for system planning and evaluating the impacts of planning. Direct on targets. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good catch. Yeah. All right. Uh, counselors, any other questions? Uh, Councilor Nolan. Thanks, Madam President. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm interested as you think around the 35 mile sustained pace or speed, um, are we moving in a direction that includes design elements um, that are built off of driver capacity um, for that? For example, the Vista tunnel is lighted up like an exam room during the night when the ambient lighting levels are dark. And so you've got the driver driving from dark or very, you know, just street light lit and irises opened into a glaring tunnel and the automatic response is to hit the brakes and then at the end of the tunnel they drive out of that bright light where their um, pupils have shrunk and then they're into dark. Um, I don't want to be an engineer but <laughs> some of my best friends are though. Um, but those are ways that we can optimize the capacity of the existing footprint and I'm I've been troubled that it doesn't seem to be working into ODOT's design book. Um, thanks for that question, Councillor Nolan. A little known fact, I really don't like tunnels. I don't like driving through them. I don't like biking through them. So I'm with you on that. Um, no offense to the engineers in the room. They're not my favorite thing. So I'm with you on this. Um, but really, I want to just kind of go back and 
repeat what Kim said, which is the 35 mile an hour is a, a planning tool to look at where there's right. deficiencies in the system. If we're seeing below 35 miles an hour, for example, at a tunnel, then it should create the conversation with the right people in the room, with the planners and the engineers to say, what is happening here? And what this mobility policy update does not do is that does not um, tell you what the solution is, right? Mm -hmm. There might be multiple solutions in this case where in some other situation, the solution might be better IT, might be better transit, right? It just identifies the problem. So I would hope in this case that it identifies that problem and creates conversation. Um, if not, changes too. But I'm not a, not a light I'm, engineer, I'm nor am I an engineer. So. I'm sure that Glenn will go back and um, ask uh, region staff about the lighting, um, please. Because uh, as we age, it is harder <laughs> for our eyes to change. <laughs> And if there's a young engineer who set that level way up. <laughs> and, and lighting even on exposed high, exposed surfaces. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Lighting yeah. can significantly affect how, keep, how drivers react. And we all know the impact of those brake lights rippling back. And when there's a fair amount of traffic, it can create congestion when there's no, nothing else stopping the traffic. And being um, smart about that yeah, no, in is all, what I'm asking for. In all seriousness, um, the next time I have a check-in with Region 1 Manager Ryan Winchemer, I will mention this to him on Thank your you. behalf. All right. It sounds like uh, for the most part we want to move forward. Uh, not for the most part. We do want to move forward with uh, allowing us to move into the RTP uh, and be part of that conversation. And I just want to say thank you. Um, to uh, both our staff and ODOT staff for uh, thinking out of the box, moving us forward. Um, the complexity of the urban environment is so different than the rest of the system. And I mean, this just makes it so much easier to have those good conversations and not have uh, standards guidelines getting in the way um, and misinterpretation of what standards and guidelines are. So it's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, counselors. Thank good. you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Go do good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's simple. Appreciate it. Simple timer on the top. All right. The um, we'll be moving time. on now, and we're done with the conversation around the tunnel That's lighting. Idea, uh, we'll move on to our Chief Operating Officer Communication. Uh, Marisa, do you have anything to add today? Thank you, President Peterson, and hello again, counselors. Um, you know, this week our senior leadership team um, had its had its re regular meeting, and we dedicated um, almost all of that time to debrief last week's budget retreat that that you all had. Um, it was an exciting and productive discussion that we had um, as a team, and I just wanted to share our collective takeaways with you and invite you to, you know, affirm, edit, uh, you know, re respond to those either, you know here in the moment or, you know, to uh, contact me directly. We can talk about it in our next one-on-ones, -on -ones. but I wanted to share the takeaways with you while they were fresh, um, fresh in all of our minds. Um, so specifically on, on the budget and each of your priorities, we've captured those um, and we're going to work on a summary of the themes. We may reach out to you for clarifications if we have questions, um, but for all those things for the next budget year, I'm going to kind of set those aside because those are more tactical things that we can definitely, we will work work with you on. Um, what I what we really spent a lot of time in SLT talking about yesterday was the discussion that you all had around long term, long term strategic vision and goals. Um, so collectively, we heard loud and clear that as we emerge from the pandemic and the disruption that it caused, that there is a desire on Council to establish new long term strategic targets and goals. We heard a desire for those goals to be high level within our sphere of authority, quantifiable and independent of department silos. So, you know, targets that are big enough to make a measurable difference in our region and that our diverse set of departments can align their work toward. So my office is working very closely with Chief of Staff Kristen Dennis, our GAPD team and our community engagement experts to design and propose a process to define and set those targets along with a timeline for that work. 
Um, our senior leadership team is energized and excited to engage in this work with you. And uh, we look forward to the conversations. Um, lastly, as we listen to the retreat, we also all came away uh, with the realization that the last few years have really had an impact on communication between departments and council. And we have a lot of new members on council as well. Um, in our SLT debrief, we talked about the need for us to more intentionally communicate with you about the things happening in departments that might assist you in crafting policy and moving the region forward. Um, we know that we have limited time with you and we are a large complex organization with a lot of moving pieces. Um, it's sometimes hard to know what's important to elevate, but I speak on behalf of all of the senior leadership team when I say that we want to get to know you, your unique interests and perspectives better. We want to be responsive to your needs and we want you to feel seen and informed. So look for more conversations about what that internal communication frequency, mode, and scope should be um, for you collectively, but also for you as individuals, um, because we think that with some intentionality, we can really improve things. Um, so again, we the, the biggest take home though, is that we as a team are really excited about the work ahead and the opportunity to come together as a team, council, and staff leadership. And, um, you know, excited for the impact that we can make on the region, because that's ultimately why we all come to these jobs, um, because there's meaning here and uh, an ability to uh, affect change on some of the gnarliest um, challenges that our community and our people and our families uh, have. So um, that's it. Happy to, to chat now a little bit more or just um, follow up in our one-on-ones. Uh, I would just like to say thank you to Marisa um, and Kristen Dennis for uh, some really hard conversations over the last week and a half um, coming out of uh, our council retreat and what I think um, I think we've come to a really good starting place to have uh, a conversation around what 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 could be those goals, those overarching goals that we would uh, try and challenge the region, not just ourselves, um, to achieve. Show what authority we have, what influence we have. But really, um, this is a team effort to get through a bunch of the gnarly issues uh, that we have in our region, and uh, that we're all in. Right, no matter what department, we're all in in, in all of those goals. And I think that that that's a great starting point. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of work going uh, behind the scenes to try and start that conversation with us. So I very much appreciate um, the, those conversations and where we're headed, so thank you. Um, counselors, any communication? <sighs> Councilor Lewis, you'd have disappointed if you hadn't raised your hand. <laughs> Thank you. I attended as our liaison the Merck meeting yesterday. It was technically a very brief meeting followed by a lengthy budget retreat. Uh, so lengthy that I had to leave before they concluded, but uh, their budget retreat, they took deep, deep, deep dives into three venue budgets and the business cases over the next few years. Um, and as we saw the highlights or the lowlights of uh, the the uh, forecasts last week, um, there are some challenges ahead. Um, most interesting to report back on policy discussions that were related. Um, they did have an in-depth discussion about uh, safety and uh, how to move forward uh, with the balance between needing uh, more safety presence and also what we're learning out of the reimagining policing group. So uh, lots that is under discussion and consideration there, and obviously will be site specific for each of the, the venues. I also uh, wanna raise the uh, resignation of John Erickson, who has now served on Merck, I believe for four, maybe five years. Um, and he's been an extremely valuable member He's been a mentor to our staff, to other Merck commissioners, to me. Um, and I just want to have a moment to thank him here in this venue publicly for what he's done as a public servant in this capacity and others. Uh, it is a big loss for him uh, to no longer be able to serve. Uh, so John Erickson will be missed. Uh, he's been an excellent member 
of the Merck Commission and just want to thank him for his public service. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we're all giving applause back here. <laughs> awesome. Councilor Craddock. Excuse me. Um, the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District um, is meeting weekly now, uh, has been for quite a while. Uh, this is the interim board that was appointed by some of the members were appointed by the governor. Others are, are like myself, are representing agencies. Of course, I sit on there as a representative of Metro. And so this is the uh, board that's going to move to the voters in the near future, uh, asking the voters in Multnomah County that are, live in the urban growth boundary uh, if they would support um, construction bond measure that would be used, the funds from that would be used to match what the Corps of Engineers will be bringing forward to upgrade our levee system along the Columbia River between Troutdale and Sobeys Island. Uh, good news is now officially the Corps' um, budget item is officially in, been appropriated. Uh, the Corps' budget has to be presented by the, the President of the United States and so it's an actual line item in the president's budget, and Congress approved that yesterday. It's still not officially, if I get my terms right, it's appropriate. It's still, the funding's still not yet totally available. So before those funds can even access those funds, before the Corps can do any of their work, we have to bring a local share, just like we do with other uh, large construction projects in our region. And so the, the um, board is now beginning to work on um, beginning to have conversations about what that will take and uh, looking at probably uh, moving it forward to the voters in 2023. In addition to that, then the board and of course staff that support the board are we're working on is uh, operating budget. And that will likely be a budget that will be, um, funds will be the, uh, available through a utility fee. And the challenge is, is how that utility fee gets levied. Um, I originally had thought or had hoped that the cities would be able to do that for the um, district because at this moment the district doesn't have the authority and I this is where I get lost in the um, legal legal part of this so they're exploring what options they have available to uh, develop um, an operating to develop um, a utility fee. And it may uh, be through uh, wa the watershed management side of things mm -hmm. that the cities have available. So to be decided, uh, that will be um, officially decided later in the future. I know, of course, I'll be leaving the board and uh, I know Metro Council President Peterson will be appointing another Metro Councilor to sit on this uh, interim board. But they really has come together. It's uh, the board consists of appointees by the governor. It consists of uh, staff from some of the cities, and it also consists of electeds in the region, right, in Multnomah County. So it's a good group of people that have really worked well, and also people that are um, former members of the three um, drainage districts that already have been in place for many years that have been managing this levy system. And so it's a real good composite of people across Multnomah County that have ha been having these discussions. I don't know if you're aware, but Jim Middaw is the uh, executive oh. director for the district, He's doing a really good job leading the charge on this. And his experience at Metro is really playing a, a really positive and significant role in helping this group of people come up with a, developing a new agency, uh, developing an offering budget, finding funding for that offering budget, and then moving to the voters um, construction bond uh, to help with matching what the Corps of Engineers can bring uh, to upgrade the levy system. So I, I will pass it on. I have one more meeting, and I'll pass it on then to the next Metro Councilor that will sit on this. Well, Councilor Craddock, thank you so much for uh, all the work over the years to getting to the point where it is. Um, you've been very diligent about that, and I don't think that there are a whole lot of folks in the region that truly understand um, the amount of de devastation that could occur um, mm -hmm. sure. if, if there was a flood to happen. And uh, there, there is so much economic development uh, at stake up in, in that part of our region. Um, and so much of our economy is dependent on that part of our region as well as um, there's a significant number of housing up there. And sure. uh, I, I think, I think it, it's good to have your attention on it. Um, 
because of your understanding of the whole topic. So thank you. Thank, thank you for becoming the resident expert. <laughs> I, if I could I just might say, I, so if this, we can't move this forward if an operating budget is not figured out how we're going to fund that and the construction bond is not done so the core can do their work. The businesses and agencies and people that live behind this levy will not be able to get flood insurance. If, if you're a business and mm. you don't have flood insurance, you can't get a business license. So this has huge economic impact, in particularly in Multnomah County, but for the entire region. So this is not something that's frivolous. We're doing just because it's kind of fun to do. It uh, really has huge impacts on our, our regional economy. Yeah, and, li and I had been saying figuratively that we've had our finger in the dike to help the region and the state through the COVID, but we literally, literally have. <laughs> Councilor Gonzalez. Thanks, President Peterson. Uh, Councilor Kardak, I'm really going to miss your updates um, because I feel like I learned so much <laughs> about the process and how hard it is to uh, take something like that from start to finish. And um, uh, really good work, really good work. Uh, a few updates uh, for me. One, I want to thank Councilor Rosenthal for reminding me to present that uh, this Saturday, Unite Oregon is organizing a uh, TV highway uh, tour with the Equity Coalition and the Leadership uh, Committee, um, Leadership Cohort, apologies. It's a, it's a constellation of community leaders and community members that live alongside the corridor um, and will have the uh, opportunity to, uh, if you recall a few months ago, the Steering Committee, which is a group of agency staff, elected officials, were able to go on a tour. And so, you know, this opportunity for that same level of access and learning um, uh, will be really great. Um, second, I uh, just want to thank um, Metro staff and all of the individuals that uh, helped make the uh, 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 Councilor Bob Stacy Celebration of Life uh, celebration here at MRC last weekend special and memorable. And seeing the council chambers full to the brim uh, was just a, a really nostalgic um, and, uh, you know, just a, a lot of memories with with Bob and um, it was just a, a very um, beautiful opportunity to uh, to be with community. Lastly, uh, I uh, serve on the uh, Port of Portland's International Air, Air Service Committee, um, and uh, there was an update uh, that was uh, released at the last meeting that I just thought would be helpful. Uh, the real ID implementation date um, was May third, twenty twenty three. If you remember, uh, a, you know, your driver's license without real ID certification would no longer allow you to travel through uh, an international port or maybe even just travel on, on air. Um, uh, that date is now extended to May 7th of 2025. Uh, so this is a pretty important update, I think, um, because of the, uh, the general angst, I think, or anxiety around uh, this year and travel and, and all that, especially uh, on airplanes. So important updates. Great, thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, uh, the council meeting is adjourned and our next meeting is scheduled for December 13th, 2022 at 10.30 a.m. Thank you so much. Recording stopped.